Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad you decided to join us. We hope you've been with us before, but in case you haven't, this is a series in which we're following the Sabbath School lessons uh, prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this lesson is entitled Personal Evangelism and Witnessing. It's lesson number six, where, which we'll be studying in our churches on May 12 of 2012. We always would like to, like to begin with a word of prayer. We're going to ask you, ask you to bow your heads with us. <clears throat> Our kind and wonderful Father, we ask that you will forgive us for having in any way delayed your second coming. Now as we talk about one of the important things that we ought to be doing to try to speed up that time, help us to see it clearly to recommit our lives to what needs to be done. And may we go forth with renewed energy is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. To just remind all of us, um, it has been said by many. It's, you can de derive this from scriptures. You can derive it from the writings of Ellen White. But basically, there are three things that each individual in the church needs to do in preparation for entering heaven. One is Bible study, the second is prayer, and the third is witnessing. And during this series of 13 lessons, we will be focusing on the witnessing aspect of that. So, how can we better witness personally? And what would happen if we, each one, individually did that? What, how would it impact the church as a whole? And maybe I should ask you, before we get into our lesson, into details, and you can think about this as we move along, what grade would you give yourself on witnessing? And You know, you talk about the three aspects, and mm -hmm. one is witnessing. Can you explain why that's important? Yeah, I can. I can explain why that's important. Two really major reasons the first reason, of course, is that that's the way we tell somebody else we get more people to, to join the church. That's a huge issue. But there's another one that's maybe just as important that we, we don't realize, and that's if you have to understand the teachings of the church well enough to explain it to somebody else, you're way, way, way ahead uh, of the average member who just has a general idea of what that, that, that teaching is. If you have to understand it well enough so you can explain it to somebody else, that's a huge jump for you in terms of your understanding. Gordon. Doesn't witnessing imply that we are dedicated to that cause also? Also. Yeah, absolutely. So it's probably good to be able to talk to other people about what you're understanding. Yeah. I think I got a case in point where there was a, a fellow down in Walla Walla that um, he's an older guy, very, very conservative, but he had crazy ideas. He just, he lived in, in his house by himself. He was kind mm -hmm. of a hermit. Mm -hmm. He didn't really talk anything over with anybody. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I remember I was working for the radio station there, and he'd call mm -hmm. up all the time telling us all the things that we were doing wrong <laughs> and everything, and we thought he was a crackpot. And um, I think I think part of the problem with him is that he never really got out into a Sunday school or Sabbath school and, and actually throw his ideas out mm -hmm. to people to have them, you know, go back feedback. and forth for mm -hmm. feedback. Yeah. So I think that might be an important um, mm -hmm. aspect of witnessing. Yeah. Of course, witnessing, uh, there's a lot that can encompass witnessing other than just, just teaching. Um, but um, there is a, I don't know if it's a Chinese saying or what kind of a saying it is, but I've heard it and from personal experience I know there's something to it. If you want to really learn something, just teach it. Yeah. You should know by personal experience. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, you want, if you want to get to where you, you really know something, uh, you just, uh, just teach it and it's amazing how much you learn. Because somebody mm -hmm. will go, what? Well, yeah, exactly. I go, why don't you just mulling it over in your head or whether you have to answer the questions or, or whatever it is. Well, but a lot look. of time when you read something, say that you write something down, you think it's perfectly clear, so it's clear you know, 
And then somebody else writes it, and they say, well, what did you mean by that? And I read it again. Oh, yeah, I guess that doesn't make sense. <laughs> so, Well, um, what grade would you give the average Seventh-day Adventist for his witnessing capacity? Depends. How many Adventists are witnessing in any way? Which country? And that's another question. Well, and, and once again, are you, are you talking about teaching, or are you talking about uh, just being uh, okay. a good hard worker and faithful to your employer, you know, honest? Um, um, you know. And that, that's one of the questions we want to discuss. Uh, do, do you have to be like almost a preacher and stand up and, and preach to an audience in order to be a witness? No, there's a many ways in which you can be involved in witnessing, and that's, we'll, we'll talk actually a lot more about that next week. But um, the, yes, that's, there are many ways in which you can be involved in witnessing, and not everybody has to stand up and preach or do something like that, or even give an individual Bible study. So but there's a like commitment mm -hmm. that's common to all of them. Yes, yeah. And I, I suspect that that's where we have our problem. That's a problem. Well, during the last year, let's just think about it. How many people have you invited to attend a church service or a Sabbath school class or some other church function during the last year? Does your church hold meetings that you feel comfortable inviting non-Adventists to attend? Well, If not, why not? Why would I, why in the world would anybody accept my invitation to come to church? Uh, that, that's not affiliated with my, with my church. I ask them, hey, would you like to come to church? And let's suppose they say, well, yeah. Uh, when is it? And I say, well, it's Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. Well, you know, Saturday morning for somebody who is not a, yeah. a Sabbath keeper. Now, you know, you might get by with that with a Jewish person or a Seventh-day Baptist, but this, uh, you know, they mow their yards on Saturday or they, they may have uh, the Little League team meets on Saturday. Uh, so... You know, who in the world, why in the It depends on how much they like you. Well, what about, what about the, um, the Mormon family that lives down the road that I'm scared they're going to come and ask me to go to church with them? What's wrong with that? Well, um, probably nothing, but, um, <laughs> uh, you know, as far as roles go, you know, you're kind of switching back and forth there. Yeah, well, that's so you gotta, okay. So you got to deal with that. So I'm probably the only one that has come through as a result of witnessing <coughs> um, in this group, maybe. Um, I went to, when I wasn't an Adventist, the Geoscience Institute was having a event on creation that was interesting. And the witnessing by the Seventh-day Adventist there was wonderful. Uh, one lady came, she stuck like glue, answered my every question, uh, followed up, was a friend. And that really is a wonderful way of witnessing mm -hmm. when someone does stumble into some kind of event, a um, health lecture or whatever, to just befriend that person, answer questions, and she gave me more abundant answers than I even wanted, but it was very good. Mm -hmm. And uh, but the big thing about you, though, is that you had an interest in the first place. Yes. Well, there oh, are people. He, he's talking about the neighbor that doesn't know squat. I'm talking about anybody that you can that you can uh, reach out to in one way or another. Um, well, that's what I. See, I, can, I can tell you about experience I had a number of years ago. This wasn't rec just recently, when I was somewhat younger. And I was part of a church in which there was a doctor and another doctor in the church and a pastor. And we were doing five-day plans to stop smoking. We were doing cooking, school, cooking classes. We were doing exercise classes. And the community was signing up months in advance to get into those classes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And... And, and, and that church was filled. I mean, and, and I can tell you what happened. It, when, when a five-day plan to stop smoking was held, and they, we did one every month, the pastor and the doctor were, were up front, but every two or three 
person, people trying to stop smoking, were assigned to two Adventist church members that would come and, and coach them and, and be close to them and invite them to their house, etc. And that church was on fire. Mm -hmm. I can tell How you. How big was that church? It was about 90 members, 75 to 90 members. Yeah. And that, that church almost doubled, doubled its mem membership in about a year. And even if the people don't stay at that church, they take the knowledge with them, and mm -hmm. that um, then God will bring other people into their lives. Mm -hmm. And you never know what's going to happen then. You know, I, I know a church, uh, Ken, that um, probably uh, when this program is aired, they and their very few members will gather in their in their sanctuary, and they'll have kind of a big screen there, and they're going to be watching us for their Sabbath school. And then, you know, when you have that kind God of... God bless them. Well, I, you know, I'm cheering for them too, but, you know, how do these people invite, you know, how, how do they say, hey, come and watch our program on TV? Oh, you know? I mean, if, if it's on... If, if, here's, here's what happens. So let's, let's just be a very, take a very, very practical example. The only way you can get people to come and watch your program on TOE, if that's what you have, is to say, you know what? Last week, we talked about this and this and this. It was fantastic. It was interesting or whatever like this. You ought to come and listen next week. And if something is said that piques their interest, they'll come. Especially if you keep inviting. I mean, I can, I can tell you about a case where my wife and I were involved. She met this lady at the laundromat. And she kept talking to her. And this lady was a devout member of another church. And she later told us, she says, I just kept hoping you wouldn't invite me to your church because I wasn't supposed to go to your church. And my wife invited her. And she, oh, no, I, I have other things going on. She invited her again. Oh, no, I have something else going on. But about the third or fourth time, she couldn't think of anything else she had going on. And she couldn't make excuses, so <laughs> she came. And she ended up joining our church. So, I mean, and I don't, and I'm trying to set myself up by any kind of example, but I'm just saying these are the kind of things that actually work. You know, Mrs. White says that um, we should make an effort for for. Um, how shall I put it? Well, prominent members in our community. Um, more often than not, and, and perhaps that's the way it is, Jesus seemed to have a strong appeal for those of us who are, I guess, simpler folk in this life. <laughs> um, the average person mm -hmm. or the person in great need. But, you know, how do you, how do you reach these tycoons? How do you reach these... Hot I shot, uh, uh, I don't know, patent attorneys or... Uh, I, I, I would say when, when Jesus reached Paul, he, he reached somebody of pretty high position. Well, yeah. Well, two by four. Th yeah, but that was Jesus. <laughs> that two by that four. was Jesus that showed up. I can't go around blinding people. And Nicodemus. Well, and Nicodemus. Nicodemus. pretty high up there. Yeah, he was yeah, very but, high. Yeah, but Nicodemus. And Joseph of Arimathea. And if you read Acts 15, you find out a whole bunch of Pharisees joined yeah. the Christian church. Huh? Mm -hmm. And those well, people didn't join because they were compelled to, because they were already in the top echelons. So we need to, we need to think about what happened, what, what, and, 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 and the, part I, the part that worries me is not that, that part, how do we reach out to those people, although I'd love to be, do that. The part that worries me is the Sabbath school classes that are so boring and so slow that the church members themselves don't come to them. <laughs> I mean, well, now that's going to cheer a lot of <laughs> Sabbath school teachers that are teaching in a lot of small Sabbath schools this morning. I'm just, just <laughs> telling you, I've been to a few places like that. There was a time when I was a little um, scared to ask somebody because I knew the Sabbath school I was going to was boring, mm -hmm. and um, I didn't know if if <laughs> that would be a good deal. I thought maybe I'd better wait until a teacher got better or something. <laughs> and but. and the same here. And I didn't know how to make it any more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's let's go to some very practical points. There's no question about the. I mean. What are the chances that someone is just going to sort of walk down the street on Saturday morning 
and walk into your church and attend your Sabbath school class. It could happen. But it's it not could bad. happen, but it's all, um, you know, the chances are somewhere close to 0%, okay? There's, studies have been done. 83% of new converts consider the influence of a friend or family member as being very significant in their conversion. Okay, 83%, that's five out of six, okay? 64% of those who attended a public evangelistic series. I mean, this is the time when we're making an all-out effort to, to reach everybody in the community. 64% of those people did so at the invitation of a close friend. So what does that tell us? Personal influence is very important. We have to have friends who are non-Adventists. Well, we have to be also be a little bit patient. Yeah. I mean, you can't go in there second time you see him and, and grab him by the shoulder and say, hey, come with me. Yeah. You know, because um, it takes a while to become friends, doesn't it? There are people, and I'm getting back to my point, but think about this. There are people who say that the real measure of your Christianity is not, you know, how well you can spout the doctrines, but how many people you have brought into the church. Ken, the discussions of Sabbath school classes and so forth that might not have been optimal. If you find that that's the case, jump in and get involved and start the discussion in a different direction mm -hmm. and see what happens. I don't know how to and do that. One of those, that would be one of the goals of, of, of this group. If someone hears us suggest some things or talk about some topics uh, on this program that might stir up a little discussion in your class, that's exactly why we're doing this. You know, I think you are underestimating the Adventist Bible study and message. Mm -hmm. If you think this church is boring, you should <laughs> see the other churches. <laughs> and you have a lot to offer yeah. and go out and get a DVD of these exciting pastors. Mm -hmm. People don't expect a, a exciting Sabbath school every time they come, but mm -hmm. just the warmth of a, yeah. a friendship. Yeah. But these, these, the Adventists are going gangbusters on TV mm -hmm. and the DVDs, the CDs that people can listen to in their cars. You got them captured in the car. Give mm -hmm. them a CD to listen to on yeah. the way to work. Sure. Absolutely. I, I have tried to get Sirius Radio to cover, to carry 3ABN Radio. You can't even talk to those people and I don't think they want any religion. But um, the car is a wonderful place. To, uh, There's an excellent idea. L now let, well, let's I'd get ask. back to the, p the point. <laughs> Again, the personal issue. I mean, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but when your friends, your non-Adventist friends, look at you, do they see anything that attracts them? Well, are we supposed to try for that? Well, the Bible says, Matthew 5, 16, People are supposed to look at us, and they're supposed to give thanks to God for our witness. That's know, what the Bible says. How, is that under our control, though? Well, I mean, of course it's under our control. You, you can be representing the devil if you want to. Well, I know, but um, it's almost like you have to hold your mouth right. Well, if, if, you, if, you're asking, <laughs> if you're asking whether or not the Holy Spirit will jump in when you're ready, the, I can answer that question. He, absolutely he'll jump in. So let's not let's not start blaming God for for our, our failures. Well, I'm not blaming God. I'm just wondering about ourselves okay. because it's it's well, coming you, across to me like, hey, you over there, you're not doing your job. <laughs> well, Go for it. Well, you know, you in know? the '70s, my mom and I first encountered an Adventist in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Definitely different people. Mm -hmm. I was looking and looking, and they were so quiet, kind pale and thin. <laughs> they're, not as, they're not as pale and thin today, but um, the Adventists, if you go to different communities and you come to Loma Linda, you will see a different, yeah. calmer, quieter, pleasant, happy person that you don't see in the malls yeah. of the... So... And, and to, to add to that, uh, you will find if you look around the country that communities that used to be almost like Adventist ghettos a lot of other people are now moving into those communities because it's safer, it's quieter, it's a, it's a better place to live. It's a wonderful group of people. Yeah, I think it's you're true. selling yourself short. I mm -hmm. think you can tell. I really do. I, my nephew went to a um, 
convention center, mm -hmm. and uh, Doug Batchelor was talking, and he's not an Adventist. And I asked him, I said, um, what's different about this group? And he looked around and he said, there's no heavy people. <laughs> and, and he, you know, I was just curious what his... Impression yeah, but it, it definitely is a different group of people when you, when you extract them from the general population. Yeah. When Jesus was out witnessing... What were you going to say? Oh, I'll, I'll listen again. <laughs> okay, when Jesus was out witnessing, it says he looked on the crowds and had compassion on them. Well, how, what does that look like? What, I mean, was that, was that some kind of divine capacity he had? Um, it's just simply noticing them. I mean, you could just, we do that? Oh yeah, we could. That's that's a good thing. To do you do. think? Do you think that? Well, in my business as a physician, do you think it would make a difference to my patients if I they saw that when they came in, I had compassion on them? They do see that, and they, they hug do you, that. and they do. There's a little story in the book Evangelism called an impressive scene. In the visions of the night, a very impressive scene passed before me. I saw an immense ball of fire fall among some beautiful mansions, causing their instant destruction. I heard someone say, we knew that the judgments of God were coming upon the earth, but we didn't know they were coming so soon. Others with agonized voices said, you knew? Why then didn't you tell us? Mm -hmm. We did not know. On every side, I heard similar words of reproach being spoken. This is the opposite of... Mm -hmm. Well, but we preach today that that's no... I mean, you don't want to... That's no right reason to be telling people. People should be motivated for a relationship, not because they think some ball of no. fire might fall on them oh, real quick. Hold on. We're talking about people who aren't motivated at all. I mean, any kind of motivation is better than none, right? Let me tell you a story of, of, of a case I know about. This guy was blind, and he was a little guy bent over like this and so forth, and he took a copy of Great Controversy, and he would go down the street, and he would walk up to, you know, work his way up to the door, knock on the door and said, excuse me, he said, I'm very sorry, but I'm blind, and I, I, I just love this book. Would you be willing to take a few minutes and read to me out of this book? And he was the best soul winner in that whole church. Because as soon as he, they would start reading, he said, well, what do you think that means? Why did they say that? You know, I mean, and, and now some of you can say, oh, but he had an advantage. He was blind. Is that an advantage? I mean, what kind of advantages do we have? I'm just, we're just giving examples. I mean, Moses, even Moses back in the Bible, when God called him and said, oh, no, I can't, you can't, call, don't call me. I'm no leader. I can't go and do what you want. I, I can't do anything. And he was one of the greatest leaders that's ever existed in our Earth's history. Well, Norm's uh, repetition of the story from evangelism. Uh, you didn't give us a reference, by the way. Evangelism, page 34, paragraph 1. 43, paragraph 1. Okay. Is cited after the event takes place. Mm -hmm. But if you talk to them, if you would have talked to those people before the event takes, took place, yeah. like when I talked to my neighbor, he says, Dennis, the world's been here for six million years. Yeah. Six billion years. It'll be here for another six billion years. W wasn't there a Get out problem? of my face. Wasn't there a parable that Jesus talked to about going to the other side? And he says, can you just send me back if I can just mm -hmm. tell him that, you yeah. know, and Jesus says, it doesn't matter. You can bring somebody from the dead. It, they won't change their mind. Well, and, that, that, and there's a lot of people going to be like that. But we have to find the ones that are not like that. But, but do you want to be the one to whom they give the reproach? You could have saved me and you didn't. Well, it depends who's saying it. The lost one is saying that. Well, they're all lost if they're lost. Yeah. Well, so, but they so didn't need, you don't care they about, didn't. You, don't care, you don't care, a whole bunch of people out there, you don't care if they sell you, you know, you could have warned me and you didn't. You don't care. It's only if it's one of your friends that you care about? No, no. I'm just saying, why am I beating myself up because of that? Why not? 
Well, why should I? Because you, you will them. feel you will feel very rotten How when it I happens know to if you. I would have saved them. Listen, well, I, I think all you can do, all you can do, is just be loyal to God and not be ashamed of Him, and just live that way. That's going to be the only way that you're going to really witness there. Yeah. And whether you're putting enough effort in it or not, I mean that that's kind of distracting, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> guess um, I won't ask you. People, people are curious about God. They don't know who God is. No. And if you just start explaining some things about God, it really piques their curiosity. Don't even mention church. Don't invite them to church yeah. or whatever. Just start talking about God and maybe hell and and uh, and different views and stuff. And uh, I think that ropes them in. A very interesting experiment was done by a very good friend of mine over in England. And they went around, you know, and you know, the churches are just being closed down, blah, 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 just almost nobody in England goes to church anymore. So they went around and they said, um, what do you think about God? And everybody, you know, if you, I say, what do you think about the church? What? And they, they won't even give you the time of day. Mm -hmm. But what do you think about God? Oh, well, da, 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 da. And you could get all kinds of people to tell you what they think about God. And that's a great way to start a conversation. Because, I mean, honestly, we're more concerned, we should be more concerned about what people think about God than what they think about our church. Absolutely. Once that conversation is started, <clears throat> what do you say? Well, it, dep it depends on what they say. You, 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 need, you need to respond to what they see their needs are. But, um, and you try to answer their questions if you can. And then, of course, the, the really ideal solution to that would be as if there are people that you know around in your community say, well, you know, we're having a, we're having a, a, trouble, a, tri a trip through the Bible. Um, why don't you join us? And let's see what the Bible says about God. That would be ideal. You know, one of the, uh, one of the things that has been the most enriching for me <clears throat> in some years outside of participating in this program and in Word Pictures, <clears throat> even because of the same nature, is, uh, is um, like a Tuesday night Bible study group. Mm -hmm. Um, the one that I became intimately c connected with was um, uh, an interdenominational group. It was um, some Adventists, a group of r some runners that they had met. They were non-denominational, but uh, just to, and all we did was just, uh, we opened it up just like we have done in Word Pictures, started with Genesis, and just started moving our way through. And now we have the, we have the privilege of having some pretty, uh, knowledgeable and experienced people here, and uh, uh, some groups may not have that, but what, one thing that I found was if you get start in and you start finding yourself in this story <clears throat> to some parts that, I don't know, seem to be boring to you or you're lost in, then kind of skip that part and move ahead. Keep, that's right. Find, go on up into the story and find the story and follow it through. Yeah, exactly. Well. One of the interesting things that might be an issue is chapters like Psalm 139. I don't know if you've looked at that recently. David in this, we presume it was David, it, it, the headings suggest that, although the experts tell us that the headings are not as old as the original script, so we, I suppose we can't know for sure that it was David. Um, but here David says, God, you know me. You know my strengths, you know my weaknesses, you, you knew me before I was born, etc. He goes down to here. And he makes all kinds of statements about God's promises to us. Is it possible that one of the reasons why we don't witness is we're not quite sure that we have God's blessing in what we do? Are we afraid that um, we might misrepresent him or that something like that? Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I, I think it's fear. I think you're right. Yes. Because you don't want to say something to misrepresent God. You know, I frequently will ask God, just put the words in my mouth. But I'm human. And mm -hmm. sometimes my mouth opens and the wrong things come out. <laughs> How do you know it's the wrong thing? Uh, <laughs> it may not be about God. It may be about anything. But, you know, you kind of go, oh, boy, I wish I hadn't said that. But I haven't experienced it just this past week. I work at the VA, 
And Some one of my our patient, friends might not know what that is. The Veterans Hospital. Okay. Veterans Administration. And one of my patients called me, and he goes, my daughter, who we, we see him all the time, and he says, my daughter needs to do an assignment for her college work, and I'm looking for an Adventist. I think, are you an Adventist? <laughs> well, now, when I'm at work, I don't discuss religion unless they bring it up to me because it's just not appropriate in my setting. But he obviously knew. Mm -hmm. We've never discussed it. You, you should have, I, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. You should say, you should have asked when he said that, you should have asked what my friend said. You better tell me what you think one of those is. <laughs> I'll yeah. tell you if I am yeah. Well, I'm good enough friends with this patient that I, I was pretty sure he knew. Okay, good. You know, but, you know, you, you want, I, I go back and I think, now what did I say? What did I do? I don't want to have to worry about everything I do and say, but yet I also want to make sure that I don't misrepresent God. Absolutely. How do you do that? Yeah. You know, you know, Ken. I think um, I think one reason people are a little hesitant to to engage other well, Adventists are hesitant to engage other people is <clears throat> they're not sure they know what they what to say, and by that I'm they're not sure they know what their message is. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, oh, the Sabbath thing, we go to church on Saturday, and... Um, we oh, think we're better than anybody else because we do that, is something like that? Well, I don't know about that, but some <laughs> might feel that way, but, um, um, you know, and we, we creationists as a rule, although mm -hmm. more and more, you, one gets the impression that there are less and less <laughs> Adventists who, you mm -hmm. know, kind of subscribe to some of those things. But, mm -hmm. you know what, I don't think a lot of people know really what Adventists believe. You know, yeah, yeah, really what, what, what is the thing that really well, makes us different other than these weird things that if these people embrace, they're just different in their community and they have a hard time not being different, you know? Here, here's, here's a question in light of that that I think we need to ask ourselves. Who has the right to tell us what Adventists should believe? Well, well. you know, in Christianity Today, the, the magazine, mm -hmm. they're just starting what the man says is going to be a five-year series, that they're so concerned that the Sunday church people have lost knowledge or don't have doctrine, um, that they're going to start going into what our basic beliefs should be. So that's not something that's just in our church. No, um, across the all. board, um, the children are not um, learning. Maybe they're going to Sabbath school, Sunday school, but they're not learning. And well, w w give me some odds. We were talking about the fear, uh, the fear that we have if we have to witness. Uh, there's the fear that we might misrepresent God. Mm -hmm. There's also the fear that they might think us a little strange. Mm -hmm. Which do you think is the more common fear? Depends on how old you are. <laughs> yeah. Let me add a third fear in there, and I'll speak for myself. I think there are a lot of Adventists who, including myself, who have sat in pews, gone through grade school, gone to academy class. They, they've memorized a bunch of texts, but they've never really studied out what they believe for themselves. And un until you have studied it out for yourself. You cannot explain it well. So therefore, when you bring up religion, you're putting yourself on this real dangerous edge that you're going to be asked something about your church that you've done it all your life, but you really can't back it up biblically. You remember what I said back at the beginning? The reason why you need to witness is because you got, you got to figure it out for yourself before you can say it to somebody else. That's not a joke. Norm, back to you. Did you want to say something about <laughs> people who are... Well, there's a, a statement in Fundamentals of Education, page 289, that I think has, that talks about this idea of fear of what others will think of us. I mean, we talk about peer pressure in children or in youth, but there's a huge amount of peer pressure that uh, just goes right on into adulthood. When we reach the standard that the Lord would have us reach, 
You're quoting now. I'm quoting. Worldlings will regard Seventh-day Adventists as odd, singular, straight-laced extremists. Wow. And that's the standard that the Lord would have us reach. The reference? Fundamentals of Education, 289, paragraph 1. But why is that, though? Well, because those who are tied to Christ and His message are so different, motivated so differently than the worldlings, that they think some that the yeah. worldling thinks this person is odd, singular, straight-laced, extreme. Yes. The, the um, worldling can tell you the latest movie, the latest top mm -hmm. hit, the latest Oscars, the latest Golden Globes. They can tell you all about wine. They can tell you all about the big vacations. Right. Adventists or people who are Christ-centered. They're spending their evenings in their Bibles. They're doing, they're hiking, they're, they're doing things with their family. They don't have those, those connections into the world that I cannot I, discuss. Wine, movies, top hits, globes, yeah. Oscars. I don't know one thing about it. Kent, let me, let me illustrate your point. There's a very famous program, a very well, popular program on television called Jeopardy. And they answer questions about things I have not a clue about. All the details of the latest novels and the movies and who acted here and who acted there. And they I mean they rack up thousands of dollars knowing all that stuff. And then every once in a while they come up with a category about the Bible. <coughs> and they're as dumb as, you, you can't believe how ignorant those people are when it comes to simple Bible your questions. Your focus is different. How you mm -hmm. spend your time, your energy, and your money. But well, let me ask point. you this, though. What if you did know that stuff, and you could actually strike up a conversation mm -hmm. and then move them over to more Christ-centered things? I, I mean, a I person... So. Well, I wouldn't say that, because Jesus, he... he Went to all kinds of parties. Everybody thought he would, shouldn't go to. He was he there went to, to all people. kinds. He wasn't there to well, talk about well, 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 well. No, 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 no. <laughs> he he went in there. He he. I'm sure that he he related to him. Yeah. He did all that stuff, but um, I I'm not quite so sure that that's the kind of thing that makes mm -hmm. us odd right there, just because we don't know those things. Gary, he was a party novelty. He could draw a crowd of 5,000 people on a hillside in the middle of the desert. Yeah. He was a novelty for a gathering. Well, well that's true, but and why? He was asked. Why? Well, why? One of the main reasons in his case was that he was the only one around who could heal you from your diseases. Yeah, but come on. Uh, that, that's, I mean, if that's. He if was you, criticized it, for going to sinners to have to party with them. He was a party guy. He, he, well, but he didn't spend most of his time doing that. He, he spent most well, of his time preaching Well, that's true, but he was, he was able to do it, though. Yeah. That yeah. was the thing. I'm just saying that, that if you're so odd, how are you going to reach well, the, the other people? Let's talk about some very practical points in light of that. And maybe, Dennis, this is what you're going to say about But my question is this. In our own personal lives, does our lifestyle and what we do, what people see us doing, how well does that match with what they hear us saying? Well, you're talking about values. I'm talking about whether your witness, whether your, whether your lifestyle matches what you say or what people think you're supposed to be saying. But you could know a lot of stuff, but the things that you value about all those things could be the part that's odd. Yeah, it's true. But I'm, I'm asking, see, part of, we're talking about witnessing now. We're talking about how you're going to relate to a non-Adventist friend who maybe lives down the street or works with you at the, you know, or, or sees you at the store or something like this. What do they see? What do they know about you? And what do they see in you? That's what makes uh, a person interesting is that even though they're considered to have different values, they are very consistent and they um, live those values. They're not hypocritical. And then Norm's point about you're afraid to be different or something. 
Well, it depends on what you value. If you value these people that are having this opinion about you, well, you're going to be in torture forever because you're con constantly going to be different from them and feeling embarrassed. If, but if you value mm -hmm. what you believe in and God's kingdom, <clears throat> you're not going to give a hoot about what they think of you. Mm -hmm. You're just going to be very happy in your values and your system that is serving your life very yeah. well. Unfortunately, many times, the reason we don't witness is not because we're worried that we will misrepresent God as Myra was. Most of the time it's because we're afraid of what people will think of us. And that is a terrible thing for a Christian to be in. Mm -hmm. And that's where the Adventists are going to get in trouble at the end time, and I can see it coming because they are such people pleasers that they will be so afraid to go against the grain. And really, when you're, you know, in our family, um, uh, we were criticized heavily, 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 till you got to the point where you didn't care what people said anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and so then, it's nice to get to that point. It is such a freedom. So why <laughs> do you care what these people think? Well, Just care about what works for your life, and they, you will be attractive. Mm -hmm. Peter, well, go ahead, Dennis. You, you wanted to say something? Well, I wanted to go back to the subject that uh, Jay brought up. It's about what we understand, what we know ourselves about mm -hmm. our religion. And I think that, uh, that, as Jay suggested, that most people don't know how to explain mm -hmm. what they believe. They don't know what they believe. They talk, they, they, they talk a jargon that uh, everybody understands. You know, I'm saved by the blood. Mm. Uh, it's it's uh, in the shadow of the cross. Mm. Uh, but you ask them what they mean. Mm. What, what does that mean? Well, well, they just turn and walk away. Mm -hmm. we, we have s become so used to talking in, in those metaphors and symbols uh, and no one questions. You, they, they puzzle you so much that you don't before you figure out how to ask a question, they're gone. So, and, and among cl Adventists, I, th I think, a classic one is the great controversy. Mm -hmm. we, we use that term and what we believe in the great controversy and that's another, whereas grace and faith are, are, are jargons to the Baptist, are saved by the blood, I, I'm growing convinced that uh, that we, we say, we use a great, the term the great controversy and are not even really clear what that, yeah. what that really means. Well, well Dennis, uh, uh, let's <coughs> let Dennis finish here. On that subject, I was speaking with a visitor at the church and I said, I don't think one in ten Adventists understands what the great controversy is about. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, I don't think one tenth that many <laughs> know what it's about. <laughs> And so, so we were we were good friends right right, right then, <laughs> <laughs> but I've been told right right in Sabbath school class that I I don't even know what uh, I don't understand the Great Controversy. My picture of the Great Controversy is all screwed up. Well, I ask, well, what is your picture of the Great Controversy? Well, I'll give you a book that has nothing to do with the Great Controversy. So, so I don't this think this is in Sabbath school. In Sabbath mm -hmm. school, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I don't believe <laughs> that most of us understand our. Our theology, our our beliefs, yeah. uh, we, we have these these metaphors and so forth, and they don't make sense. You know, this what you're saying here is going to go all over the country. I know. I'm a little concerned about that because <laughs> because they're beginning to listen to me up there, and they might be listening to me <laughs> now. Well, you're you're <laughs> speaking at cliches because cliches well, because uh, because sir, I've heard a whole hour's worth of cliches once in a sermon. <laughs> Oh yeah. I couldn't believe it. I said, "Whoa." <laughs> well, that's, that's I know exactly what he's saying, but <laughs> only you do. Well, I well, know. You see, but that's that's the assumption. The assumption <laughs> is that you know what I'm saying so that but that's not true because ask them. They don't know what they're saying. They don't know what they're talking about. You ask them, "What what it do you mean good. by that? What do you mean by yes, that?" So, when I started teaching up there, they asked me to teach small Sabbath school class. I handed out a sheet. I said, this I believe, and I had about six or seven, the, uh, this is what I believe, this I believe. And uh, you know, that, that, that uh, serpent was placed in the garden for a purpose. But you ask an Adventist what the purpose was, they haven't the slightest clue. Mm -hmm. they, they haven't, my neighbor asked me that. 
Yeah. yeah. You know, he, he's he's an atheist. He doesn't 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 have any belief. So until we can explain our beliefs yeah. to ourselves, mm -hmm. how are you going to explain it to your neighbor? Well, let's, and uh, that's a great point. We do need to, there are some other things we need to talk about. Go ahead, Gordon, I'll let you say another word. So maybe it's good that some of us don't witness to others <laughs> until we get the story straight. <laughs> well, start that's, that's true, but, but. Is that why Jesus the, said to a lot of people, go home and keep quiet about it? <laughs> that's exactly. But over the so last nothing. few years, my understanding of my personal belief has become so solidified enough that I can't contain it. Mm -hmm. I've got to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I will talk in Sabbath school class. I will take any opportunity to share my understanding. Mm -hmm. When I, I now look forward to the Jehovah's Witness in the, uh, uh, coming up the driveway. Because <laughs> <laughs> last time they did, we talked for 45 minutes and they ran down the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to leave it on a pessimistic note though. Those who with steadfast perseverance, mm -hmm. this, is, this is steadfast over a long period of time with a lot of effort, perseverance, strive to reveal the attributes of Christ. Angels are commissioned to give enlarged views of his character and work, his power, his grace and love. Will you have something to talk about? Thus they become partakers of his nature. Try to reveal in whatever way you can <coughs> the attributes of Christ. Reference? A.G. Amazing Grace. It's a devotional book. 118.6. Mm -hmm. uh, and, well, and you know, Ken, we, we did mention, we're talking about a lot of hesitancy, we did mention at the beginning that the more you, the more you witness, mm -hmm. the better you get. The more it solidifies in your own mind, yeah. the more comfortable feel, the better, the more Absolutely. skill. Steadfast yeah. perseverance. Peter had some <clears throat> words to say in the Bible. First Peter 3, 15 and 16 from my Good News Bible. Be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope you have in you, but do it with gentleness and respect. And try to imagine what it was, and, and Paul talks in, in, in 1 Corinthians, um, I think it's, I'm going to see this, anyway, anyway he, he, he talks about Christian women, and apparently this happened fairly often, fairly often, women became Christians and their husbands were still pagans. He says, don't, don't leave them, maybe by your quiet, gentle life, you will convince them to become a Christian. And try to imagine what that would be like in Roman times, where the husband was expected to be the almighty authority, et cetera, et cetera. How would a wife win her husband to Christianity? If Paul had had the printing press, mm -hmm. the internet, DVDs, a computer. a computer, do you think he might have enlarged that capacity? He would write a whole Bible, not just a few books. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Very much. You, I mean, you might not have to give a, a big lecture yourself yeah. if you've got a wonderful DVD that, yeah. you, that, that does it well. Mm -hmm. what, what does it mean by presenting it um, Gentle, gentle gently, with respect? With respect. With love. Yeah. With love yeah, and, display, and display the love. It means, it uh, means I don't come to you and I say, sir. you dumb whatever, don't you know the Bible says, you know, that's not gentleness and so respect. So you're not supposed to hit somebody over the head with it. No. And say, you didn't do this right. Yeah, you got to do this right. This is the reason why you didn't do this but right. But there's a big difference between hitting somebody over the head and just presenting them. And, yeah. and what is the hope Peter is talking about there? Is that a talking mm -hmm. point? Mm -hmm. what, what's the hope? He, he's, he's talking about the hope of, a, of eternal life. He's talking about hope of entering the kingdom of God. Exactly. Yeah. Keep in mind that Jesus struck Saul slash Paul over the head with a big two by four on the Damascus Road and blinded him for a few days. Mm -hmm. Well, l let's take another example. Let's, biblical examples are always safe. They're quite a ways away from us and people are more or less familiar with them. <laughs> Look at John 4, 37 and 38. Now, let me remind you this story, what this story is about. This is a story of a basically very loose woman who's now with her fifth husband and she's not even married to him. 
etc. And Jesus comes along and asks her for a drink. And the conversation gets up. And finally, she, you know, Jesus reveals something that we wouldn't be able to reveal, you know, proves that he knows her life story. And, and he says, she says, I perceive that you're a prophet. And then uh, she leaves her water pot behind and she runs back into town. And what does she say to the people in town who probably know quite a bit about her? <laughs> and what kind of a character she is. It's been the conversation of a lot of... She probably had a lot of conversations about her. Yeah. So she is not exactly the, the missionary you expect, right? And what did she say? Come and see. Come and see. See the what? See well, in, the, her, in this case, person, it was Jesus. The person that knew her. Yeah. Mm. She really has never, the stranger she, that knew what yeah. she had done. She had to have credibility in that town. She, something about her they listened to. Well, I think she came, back, she came charging into that town with a look on her face that just grabs everybody, grabbed everybody's attention. She was so excited and so shocked. And I mean, you know, she probably went running down Main Street, you know, <laughs> shouting. I've heard it suggested that she was there in the afternoon at the well because that was a time when the rest of the uh, community yeah. was not at the well. Yes. Is that she could go there in the privacy of absence. Yes. Uh, and now she goes running down Main Street mm -hmm. saying, C come look. This is, this is, she is expressing something that she's not expressed before. And this is an, a great example. Several people have, have suggested it. We might raise a question, and maybe we don't think we're qualified to, to answer it, but have a look at this DVD. Listen to this CD. Here's a and book. what question did this woman ask? She said, could he be the Messiah? Yeah. She, yeah. she didn't say, he's the Messiah. He said, no. ask the question. Yep, exactly. So there are different ways of doing this. How effective was her witness, by the way? Very. Jesus stayed in that town for several days, and many of the members in that town, and what did they say at the end of those several days? Now we believe, not because of your witness, because of what we, heard. Because of what we saw for ourselves. Yeah. Jesus saw something in the demoniac and something in her. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, the people he used to witness. An another issue, and I I'm trying to cover most of the points in our lesson. Another issue is that God has given every one of us gifts. And those gifts, if you read Ephesians 4, you read other places in the Bible, those gifts were given specifically with the intention of helping us witness. There are quite a few of us who don't even understand what our gifts are. How do we find out what our gifts are? And we don't have a time for a long lesson on that, but maybe we need to ask our friends, what do you think my gifts are? How can we get together? Can we get a group of us get together and, 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 and figure out what our gifts are? And can we complement each other in having a Bible study or, or something of that nature? It seems to me that by the time one's hair turns gray, he should have a pretty good idea of what his what his gifts and skills are. That, that is an excellent point. Start a program that takes a lot of different talents. Mm -hmm. And when people come to it, they'll kind of sort themselves out and say, yeah. well, I'll do this, I'll do that. And they'll, they'll do what their gift is worth. At the same time, Jesus talked about seeds being planted. And he talked about plants sprouting up out of the ground. We need to recognize that in the gospel process, there's some who are good at planting seeds raising questions in people's minds, something like that. There are others that are good at saying, well, let me explain that to you. Let's, let's nourish this plant a little bit. And there's others who are good at saying, uh, come to these meetings. Let's talk about how you can become a Christian. I mean, we don't have to know every step at every, and we don't have to be skilled at planting, nurturing, watering, fertilizing, harvesting. We don't have to do everything. And um, so, Maybe we think about what our individual skills are. Some may be reluctant um, to do things, but they, I mean, there are ladies who say, man, I would never speak up, but they can cook a wonderful meal 
and maybe that's an opportunity to have a Sabbath potluck and, and, and people come out to try the food. Maybe you want to do a cooking class. And the different ladies in the, in, in the church bring special vegetarian kind of dishes for people to try and so forth like this. You don't think God counts that as witnessing? Of course he does. Or crocheting or quilting to bring to, like my 91-year-old aunt, she crochets lap blankets mm -hmm. to bring to the old people. Yeah. <laughs> in the assisted living centers. Ellen White said these words, this is in Gospel Workers, page 193, to all who are working with Christ, I would say, wherever you can gain access to the people by the fireside, improve your opportunity. Take your Bible and open for them its great truths. Your success will not depend so much upon your knowledge and accomplishments as upon your ability to find your way to the heart. By being social and coming close to the people, you may turn the current of their thoughts more readily than by the most able discourse. The presentation of Christ and the family by the fireside and in small gatherings in private houses is often more successful in winning souls to Jesus than our sermons delivered in the open air to the moving throng or even in halls or churches. Well, why do you think that's true? She made one other statement. The last rays of merciful light, the last mer message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest His glory. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. Do you think that would be obvious to the people around us if we actually did that? The light of the Son of Righteousness is to shine forth in good works and words of truth and deeds of holiness. That's Christ Object Lessons, pages 415, goes on into page 416. Is it possible for us to manifest God's glory in our lives. Moses came down from a mountain with his face shining so bright that people couldn't look at him. Do you think we could do even a little bit of that in our day? Well, those of us who believe in the great controversy, trust healing model, the plan of salvation, have something more to reveal. We think that people, even after they've gotten into the church, need to be nurtured with a book-by-book -book class through the Bible to teach them uh, the truth about the great controversy so they know that. So even after they're in, there's something more to do. See you next week.